Good morning, church. Always wonderful to see you. Isn't it an amazing thing that God loved us so much that he gave his son for us and we can gather this morning in his very presence together? That's just incredible to me this morning. So let's look to his word as we begin worshiping. Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Let's stand and sing together. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonder of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar 
at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have. And nothing compares to the promise I am. And nothing compares to the promise I have in you. You may be seated. touch the iPad here and I don't know where it sent it but you know um, good luck with that <clears throat> okay gonna get over here a <laughs> um, couple announcements actually there's uh, several here so uh, we do have a custodial opportunity our head custodian Jamie Fuller will be taking a little time off in April when her baby boy arrives if you'd like to fill in during this time, please contact the office during the week. So next Sunday, February 19th, we will be taking a special love offering for Dwayne and Sherry Robinson. Um, she's obviously been going through some challenging health issues, and they are still traveling. Uh, Dwayne is quite a bit. And um, anyway, this is an opportunity for us to support them financially in their challenges. Uh, so that's next weekend. Men's mis uh, yeah, Women's Missionary Fellowship, Tuesday mornings at 9.30. Our Women's Missionary Group will be meeting in the Fellowship Hall. So Tuesday, they will be viewing a film on the Stamp Project. All women are invited to come join us. That is all ages. Not too often you get announcements about cookies, but cookies are a wonderful thing. So our elders are having a retreat on February 26th uh, through the 28th, and we would love to show our appreciation and love for them by sending them off with home-baked or store-bought cookies. If you'd like to bake some cookies, please have them to the church by February 25th. They're thanking us in advance. Uh, prayer today after the service, there will be uh, after 15 minutes, um, after the end of service, uh, we will be meeting in the fellowship hall for a time of prayer, and all are welcome to join us. So now is the time we <clears throat> review the catechism question, and just a little context on this question, some doctrines and characteristics of God are easy and, uh, and light, and some are challenging and a bit more weighty. And today we have one that is weighty. And I encourage you to, um, if you have opportunity, to go and get the app. And there's great commentary that is on this question. So anyway, I'm going to read the question, and then we'll recite the answer as a church body. <clears throat> are all people, just as they were lost through Adam, saved through Christ? Here's our answer. No, only those who are elected by God and united to Christ by faith. Nevertheless, God in his mercy demonstrates common grace even to those who are not elect, by restraining the effects of sin and enabling works of culture for human well-being. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful. We take great comfort and receive peace, Lord, in your sovereignty. We're grateful, Lord, that you are a good God in the midst of all your power. Lord, I pray that our hearts and our minds will uh, look to you, 
look to your word. See you for who you are. Father, I pray that this morning, as we gather together and, and set aside our individualistic you know, perspective, Lord, and come together corporately, that we would uh, seek you, look to you, turn our hearts towards you, seek your honor first. Lord, be present. And we pray all this through your son, Jesus. Amen. shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassion, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto thee. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, on Pardon for sin and the peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand feet. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see, all I have needed thy hand hath provided, great is thy faith. Lord unto me. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. 
One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory revealed. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever, one day he's coming, oh glorious day. Oh, glorious day one day they led him up calvary's mountain one day they nailed him to die on a tree suffering anguish despised and rejected bearing our sins my redeemer is he the hands that healed nations stretched out on a tree took the nails for me, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever, one day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day, one day the grave could him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered. Now he's ascended, my Lord evermore. Death could not hold him, the grave could not keep him. Rising again, living he loved Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glory will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved one bringing. My Savior Jesus is mine. Living he loved me. Dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. What a day that will be, won't it? I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone. And change the leopard spots and melt the heart of snow. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin 
had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. For nothing good have I, whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's land. And when before the throne I stand in Him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Good morning, FBC. How's everybody doing this morning? Yeah. All right. So, we're going to pick up where we left off. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read the text, and then we're going to pray. Verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, And after fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left them, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. This is God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. And Lord, we just pray that you would open our hearts to hear what you have to say. Lord, We desire to be conformed to your image. We desire to resist sin. But Lord, we thank you that where we fail, you give us grace. Lord, this morning, I just pray that you would fill us. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to walk in humble obedience to you. Help us to hear your words. And I pray that it would be your words that speak to us this morning. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So oftentimes, when I start out a sermon, one of the things that I'm trying to do is, is get your attention. So I tell a story uh, that somehow relates to the sermon, and I prayed about it and thought about it all week, and I could not come up with what in uh, fancy theological terms we call a hook. I couldn't figure one out, and I was, I was really kind of wonder, wondering why, why it was so hard in this one. And I, and I think it's because this is so foreign to us in the sense that we don't understand what it's like to always be able to resist sin. We don't, uh, we fail. We all do. We fail daily. And we, we get to watch Jesus here and he's hungry, probably feeling kind of hangry at this point 
40 days not eating, and he's still resisting the devil. He's still resisting sin. So this morning, I just asked, we're going to take about 10, 20 seconds, and I just want us to close our eyes and, and think about a time that in our personal lives, we, we just didn't measure up. And maybe it was this morning, maybe it was something you still think about 10 years ago, but in that, I want us to be grateful that even though we didn't measure up, we didn't make the mark where Christ did, He gives us grace. So we'll take about 10 seconds and just think about that for a minute. Think about the grace that God has given us through what Jesus did here in this work and and all the way through His life onto the cross and then when, when He rose again. He defeated that for us. So we can be thankful for that in these next few moments. Lord, we thank you that that you've got us covered. Lord, that even though we're not capable of doing what you did, you love us enough to cover it for us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So, there's two parallels we're going to be kind of looking at this morning with, with the temptation of Jesus. The first is going to draw us back to the Garden of Eden. We're going to see that where Adam failed, Jesus did not. And the second parallel we're going to be looking at this morning is the wilderness time in which the Israelites failed over and over and over to be led by God. They, they kept trying to do it themselves and in their own strength. And we're going to see that in the wilderness where the Israelites failed, Jesus did not. He worshiped the Father. So the big idea for today, the main thing that you need to know is simply that Jesus does what you cannot. And it's the most important thing. Not only in today's message, but that's what's so great and unique about our faith. You know, the other religions and belief systems of the world will either tell you that you have to put the work into it or that there is no point. But for us as believers of the one true God, we believe that Jesus did what we could not. So if you take only one thing from today, know that Jesus has done what we are incapable of. Jesus resisted sin. Verse 1, Jesus was led up to the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. This was the temptation to make himself like God. Now, Jesus is God. But what Satan is doing here is trying to make him Equip, he's trying to make him prove his powers. He's trying to make him be like God. But Jesus didn't count equality, to God, equality with God as something that he should have because he emptied himself out so that he could save us. So here in this, we're drawn back to the Garden of Eden. And like I said, there's connections to Israel and their time in the wilderness, but we're going get to get into that here in a little bit. Adam and Eve were in perfect comfort in the garden. They had everything provided for them, and they were given responsibility from God. And at this time, they were not broken and marred by sin. They were perfectly nourished, and there was no discomfort whatsoever in their life. They had only one rule, and that rule was to not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Everything else they had at their feet, and it was very good. But Satan came in the form of a serpent, and he appealed to them with food. And when they heard that by eating this food that God had told them not to, they could be like God, they actually believed Satan. They actually believed that there was some form of dishonesty in God. So they took of the fruit and they ate it. 
And in that moment where everything was absolutely perfect in their life, they chose to sin and rebel against God so that they could take their shot at being like God. They wanted to be God. And here's the contrast. Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil head on. Now, God does not tempt people, but He does prove and test. And the word tempted here can be translated as tempted, tested, or proved. Jesus is God in the flesh, and He cannot be tempted from the inside because there is no sin in God. But Jesus, as a human, could be tempted from the outside. And that's what Satan is doing here. But the Spirit is proving that Jesus absolutely can and will resist sin. Now pay attention to the state that Jesus was in. Okay, He's hiked to the wilderness. He's been out there 40 days, 40 nights. No food. He's hungry. Okay, I can barely go 10 minutes without precious sustenance before I'm ready to sin, right? I, I need a donut, like right now, because I'm, I'm going to sin. That, we get there, right? We, we have things, whether it's we're tired, or we're suffering, or we're hurting, or we're hungry, and those things make us want to sin. It makes us want to lash out in anger. It makes us want to make choices we know are not honoring to God because we're trying to satisfy the human need and we're getting mad that that human need or human desire is not satisfied. Adam and Eve were not in any way lacking food when they chose to sin. And then Satan the devil comes up to Jesus and he says, if you were the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. He says, if you are the Son of God. But the word if in the Greek is more accurately translated since you are. So Satan is actually saying, since you are the Son of God. He's not questioning who Jesus is. But he's saying, since you are the Son of God, you can eat the forbidden fruit. As Satan appealed to the first Adam, Satan is appealing to the last Adam, saying, it's okay to do something outside of God the Father's will because you're God the Son. Satan attempted to tell Jesus, because you're God, you can disobey God. And that's pretty tricky. Satan is really good at his job. He's fantastic at being evil. Like, really, he's good at it. He just tried to have God subvert himself by attempting to appeal to the broken human nature that makes us want to be God. But luckily... Jesus was truly human. You see, we're not truly human. Jesus is truly human in that He did not have a sin nature. Okay, We're not living as true humans because we have a sin nature, because we chose to rebel against God. But Jesus is living the way that God intended for humans to live, and that is without a sin, a sin nature. And He replied to Satan, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus knew exactly how to handle the temptations of Satan, knowing that living in obedience to God is more important than even our human needs and desires. And it is by knowing what God wants for us through the knowing of God's words that we too can understand this, that we too can learn to obey God even when our human needs and desires are not being met. And so Jesus is giving us an excellent example to follow here, that we should know the Word of God so that when the circumstances of life or even extreme spiritual warfare such as this comes knocking at our door and presenting us the opportunity to sin against our God, we know how to respond. We should know God's Word if we're going to respond against the opportunity to sin. But Satan's not done. He's going to ratchet things up here. Verse 5. The devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put your Lord, your, the Lord your God to the test. Satan is doing something kind of tricky here even. 
He's trying to get Jesus to glorify Himself before God's appointed timing. And this seems kind of weird to us at first. He's telling him, well, just throw yourself down. You're not going to be hurt. He wants Jesus to test God the Father by simply falling down the height of which would be certain death unless, unless God intervened. So we want to understand why Satan took Jesus from the wilderness to the temple here. See, the temple represented God's extreme care for His people. And surely, God would not let His own Son jump to His death there at the temple. But there's more here. Because we know that God would care about His Son even if He chose to jump from a high place in the wilderness. But the difference between throwing yourself off a cliff in the wilderness and throwing yourself off a cliff at the temple is an audience. It was 300 feet plus down to the temp, uh, from the temple down to the floor of the Kidron Valley. And the difference is the audience. The difference is glory. So, if we're going back to the Garden of Eden, one of the first things that happened after Adam and Eve sinned is that Adam tried to make sure that he left the situation with his glory intact. And he completely put blame on Eve. And then if you go beyond that a few chapters In Genesis, we get to the Tower of Babel where all mankind is seeking glory for itself. Satan was trying to tempt Jesus with glory. Satan wants Jesus to take the glory for himself ahead of the appointed time. We know that the Father is going to glorify Jesus, but Satan's trying to get Jesus to get the glory in, in his own time, a time that doesn't line up with the Father's will. And had Jesus done this in front of an audience in the temple in a way that did not line up with the purposes of God, it may have been that the Israelites would have seen this and they would have forcefully taken him and made him king over all of Israel way before God's intended timeline, way before his purposes that would bring the most glory to God. But again, Jesus uses Scripture to combat the devil. He says, don't test God. It is written, you shall not put your Lord, your, the Lord your God to the test. God is not a slave to man to do man's bidding in man's timing. And it's rebellious to put oneself into unnecessary harm to make God do something. And that's the difference here. In this temptation, the devil tried to convince Jesus with Scripture. But the devil, he slightly misquoted here. So he's quoting from Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. And he says, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. But Satan, he omitted verse 14, which says, Because he, Jesus, holds fast to me, the Father, I will deliver him. Satan omitted the fact that this promise was contingent upon Jesus doing the Father's will. And that's one of the reasons it's super important that we know the context of the Bible. As believers, we should know the specific context of passages in the Bible because if you ignore the context and you turn a specific verse or two into the pretext, you can justify just about any abomination before God. You can make it sound like God is okay with all kinds of sins, when you ignore the context. But Jesus knew the context, and he was able to combat the devil using the Word of God. So now the devil has one last temptation. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said, Be gone, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Jesus was now, or Satan was now trying to tempt Jesus with power and control and authority. It's where our sin ultimately leads to. Because like Adam and Eve, we want to be like God. We want the control. So now Satan has taken Jesus from the temple back out to the wilderness 
And now they're on another high place. And it seems here that Satan, through a vision showing him all the kingdoms of the world, is tempting Jesus to be in control of all those kingdoms. And Satan, as the prince of this fallen world, he has the power to do this. But what's interesting here is that in the Greek, where Satan says, if you will fall down and worship me, it actually implies just one time, just this once. Worship me just this once, and I'll give all of this to you. But just this once is all it would have taken for Christ not to be the appropriate sacrifice for us. Maybe it would have made Christ the king over all the earth, which we know he truly is, and we will fully realize that someday. But this was not the way to get there. The concept that Satan is trying to tell Jesus is, sidestep the cross and you can still have everything you want. If you don't go to the cross, and you don't be the sacrifice for all these people, you can have the power, the control, the glory of all the things in this world. You'll be in charge of it all. But Jesus wasn't having it. Jesus could have at any time come down in His glory. He has the right to do that. He's God. However, in His grace and love, Jesus chooses not to, whether handed to him by the devil or any other means that would sidestep the cross. Because Jesus wants as many as possible restored to himself. He wants people to have relationship with him. And he knows that's the Father's will. So he chooses to resist the devil again because sidestepping the cross would mean that he would lose all of us. He doesn't want to lose any of us. Now, I know we want God to come back. We want Jesus to come back today even. And we should. But we need to remember that in His not coming back yet, He is showing so much grace and love to those who still haven't been restored to Him. He's patiently, with steadfast love, giving mankind opportunity after opportunity to be restored to Himself. And it's all part of His sovereign plan. And in that way, we should be in awe of just how loving our God is to a perverse and unjust world that to bring as many people as possible into relationship with Him, He has not yet come back in His full glory to take all of creation, which is already His. It's like an investment. Jesus is leaving what He already has at the bank. So when he comes back in a few days, he has interest built up on it. Jesus knows that if he comes back now, he's not going to have as many people restored to himself. And he's looking for more people to have relationship with him. So he's showing mankind grace and love in not coming back yet. Does that make sense? Verse 11. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. We need to know a couple of things here. First of all, this wasn't the last time Jesus was tempted by the devil. If you read this account in Luke, Luke states that the devil left Jesus until a more more opportune time. And if we think that the devil was not throwing things at Jesus all the time, his entire life, we are misunderstanding just how impressive the work of Christ is. Now secondly, it's awesome to see that God did fulfill His promise that the angels would minister to Him, even like Satan said. But we must note that God fulfilled His promise in His timing because Jesus stayed within the Father's will. Sometimes we want God to do things in our timing because we want to be in control. But how freeing is it to see that even Jesus waited on God's timing. And he got exactly what he needed precisely when he needed it. After all that, God provided the nourishment Jesus needed through the ministering of his angels. And that word ministering literally means to serve. The angels served Jesus after he resisted the sin that none of us would have been able to. Jesus resisted the sin of the garden in trying to make himself like God even though He is in very nature God. Jesus resisted the sin to glorify Himself 
even though he gets all the glory. And Jesus resisted the sin of taking power, control, and authority, even though he already has all the power, control, and authority. And he did this in the most uncomfortable and lousy of situations. Starving and exhausted, he did this for you and for me. Now, like I said, there's two parallels in this temptation. The Garden of Eden, which we've covered, and the parallel of the Israelites in the wilderness. So, soapbox time, okay? Everybody ready? If you really want to understand your New Testament you have to read your Old Testament. Some Christians today will tell you that the Old Testament does not apply to you. And sure, based on what God is doing redemptively, we no longer are required to offer sacrifices because that's been taken care of. But if you want to fully know Jesus, it is impossible to do without a proper understanding of your Old Testament. And I'm throwing this out there because it's important, it's imperative that we as believers know this and strive to know the full word of God so that we can know God more fully, so that we can be conformed to the image of Jesus. And what scripture did Jesus use to combat the devil? We used it the Old Testament. There's a lot that we can learn and glean from about God in the Old Testament. So my soapbox is read your New Testament and your Old Testament if you really want to fully know Jesus better. That being said, through Jesus resisting the sin of the devil, Jesus worshipped God. Jesus worshipped the Father. Let's go back to verse 1. Jesus was led up by the Spirit, or led by the Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And Jesus is quoting Exodus here when he is combating, or not Exodus, Deuteronomy, when he's combating the devil here. He's quoting from scripture from the time that the Israelites were in the wilderness. But Jesus trusted God. So in the Old Testament, through God leading the Israelites in the wilderness, Along the way to the promised land, the Israelites grumbled about a lot of things. One of those was food. They were mad. They didn't have food. Kind of get that. So, God, in His grace, provided them with manna. But even then, they still didn't trust God because God said, on Sabbath, the day before the Sabbath, you're going to gather enough bread to last you through the Sabbath day. And they still didn't trust him. They still tried to go out there on the Sabbath day when there wasn't going to be any manna. They did not trust God that he would take care of them the way that he promised. When they didn't think that their human needs were being met, they were mad because they didn't trust God enough to care for them or to provide for their human needs. And when they finally figured out the bread thing, they started grumbling and they wanted quail. They wanted meat, right? So they... God in His grace did give them some meat. But the heart of it was that they did not truly believe that God would take care of their needs in spite of their circumstances. So here, where Satan is tempting Jesus, Satan is saying that since you're the Son of God, since you're the Messiah, prove that the Father cares about you by providing you with bread. Now, if it was me, I would, in my pride, probably have said, yo, jerk, you think God doesn't care about me? I'll prove to you God cares about me. Bam, bread. That's probably what I would have done. So it's a very good thing that I am not the Messiah. Because that's exactly what Satan wanted him to do. But unlike the Israelites, and often we as Christians who do not fully trust that God is taking care of us in spite of our circumstances, Jesus replied with the bigger picture and says, man does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus is saying, I have so much faith that the Father cares for me and is taking care of me and my needs 
that I don't have to prove it to you. I'm simply going to worship God through my faith in Him and know that He is taking care of me whether I have bread or not. I will live by the Word of God. Verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you were the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus recognized who God is compared to who he is. Not that Jesus isn't God, he is, but he is submitting to God the Father. Jesus recognized who God the Father is compared to who God the Son is in his submission to God the Father. So again, going back to the wilderness... The Israelites demanded things from God, not just complaining about food, but they even demanded water to come from a rock because it was a way that God had provided for them before. And in fact, they were ready to kill Moses over this because they did not worship the Father by recognizing who they were compared to who God is. What they refused to believe was that if God wants to keep you alive, he will. I know, crazy, But as it turns out, if God wants to keep somebody from dying from dehydration as they forego water for long periods of time, he can do that. He kept people alive from snake bites, right? He kept people alive as we look through our Old Testament when they were thrown into dens of lions. He kept people alive after being thrown into a fiery furnace. And he was able to keep them alive without water but they were not willing to worship God in a way that recognizes who God is and who they are. God gets to do what He wants with us, even if it doesn't make sense to us. Now, a little caveat to that. Yes, God can keep us alive in the impossible, but we must note that God put those people in those positions so that they would have the opportunity to glorify Him. We should never willingly put ourselves in positions of impossible danger to bring glory to ourselves or God. That is trying to make God our slave. When we do something stupid on purpose and think that God is going to take care of it, you're trying to make God your slave. We should never try to starve ourselves to death on purpose Or allow poisonous snakes to bite us on purpose to try to make God prove He is powerful enough. That's dumb. It is stupid. Jesus knows this. And what is His response? Don't test God. God is willing to let you reap what you sow as far as consequences go in this life. Don't test Him. Jesus knew that God was going to give Him the glory. He didn't need to test God to keep Him safe in an effort that would have brought Jesus' glory before God's appointed time. Jesus wasn't about to demand anything from God because he recognized who he was compared to the Father, and Jesus submitted to the Father. Verse 8, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Jesus only worshipped and served God the Father. Jesus worshipped and served God only. In the wilderness, the Israelites grew impatient while God was revealing his plan to Moses for those 40 days on the mountaintop. How quickly did they desire to worship something else? We're created for worship, but only for worship of God. In our sinful nature, though, we still desire to worship, but that sinful bent tells us to worship anything but God. Less than 40 days without God's spokesman, and the Israelites made a golden calf. And they said, this is the God who parted the Red Sea. This is the God who brought us out of Egypt. How quickly our hearts wander 
Satan tried to tell us, or tried to tell Jesus, if you worship me, I can give you the world. But Jesus knows the truth, and that is we shall love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. We are only to worship God. And at this point, Jesus just says, be gone, Satan. I'm going to serve my God, not you. Now, we're believers, and we do worship God. But it doesn't let us off the hook yet, because often we don't recognize that we're worshiping something else, something other than God. And it's a little something I like to call preferences. We allow our preferences to break relationships in the church. We allow our preferences to break relationships within our families. People have had church splits and broken relationships because of the type of music that is played for worship, because of the color of the carpet, because of the strategies of leadership that aren't sinful, just not preferred. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't things that should be done a certain way, but those aren't the things we argue over. We don't argue whether we should be worshiping up here. We don't argue about uh, the fact that God's word should be being taught but accompanied by proper theology, we argue about the things we prefer, the song style or how soothing the preacher's voice should be, and it just gets more ridiculous from there. And it doesn't just happen in church, but we do this in our homes, our workplaces, and our hobbies. We allow our preferences to unsinful things to break relationships and thereby becoming sin. We place ourselves and our preferences above God and his calling to his people, which is that under that we should have unity under the headship of Christ. Without even realizing it, we give our worship to something else or someone else other than God based on our feelings. But Jesus isn't having it. He's not going to worship the devil to gain authority, and he doesn't worship the possibility of authority. He worships God the Father by perfectly submitting to his will. And then the devil left them, and behold, the angels came and were ministering to him. So I'm going to make a couple of statements by way of conclusion here. Jesus did what we cannot. Jesus resisted the sin that Adam gave into. Jesus did not eat the forbidden fruit by making stones into bread. Jesus did not jump off the cliff, trying to get glory for himself. He wasn't seeking glory for himself. Jesus didn't seek power or control. But Jesus worshipped the Father by trusting the Father, by recognizing who he was compared to the Father, by his willing submission to the Father. And Jesus served the Father only. So typically... I only ask three questions, but today it's five. You're going to have to deal with it. Okay, question one. Knowing that Jesus did what we cannot means we know that we have grace when we do sin. But does that knowledge make you want to sin because it's covered? Or does it move you to desire to resist sin, to mortify the flesh, and follow Jesus with humble obedience, born out of love, because of what he has done for you. Question two. What areas in your life are you seeking glory for yourself rather than giving glory to God? Do you have thoughts like, look how good I'm doing in my family, in my work, in my ministry, with my hobbies? Now, it's not bad to, real, to recognize our good work, but we must realize it's God that gets the glory for that because He gave us the ability to do that and He gave us the opportunity to do that. He put those things in our lives. The question shouldn't be, doesn't everyone see how good I'm doing? The question should be, Father, am I pleasing you? Number three. Do you trust God even if he puts you in circumstances you don't like? 
He's going to take care of it in a way that fulfills his purposes, which are ultimately better for you. So can you let go of that control and authority over your own life? The control and authority you think you have, that you don't. Can you let go of it and willingly submit to God's purposes for your life? Number four, we're getting there. We're almost done. What areas of your life are you placing above God? What might you be intentionally or unintentionally worshiping other than God? And what steps can you take to allow the Holy Spirit to help you change the way you view those things you put above God? And lastly, do you know the Word of God? Life is going to hit you. The devil will tempt you, and your flesh will desire to sin. Do you know your Bible well enough to know how to respond to those moments of time where the option to sin is going to present itself? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you that you sent Jesus to do what we could not. We thank you that you sent Jesus to resist the sin that we could not resist. And we thank you that you sent Jesus to worship you in perfect faithfulness, to show us how to worship you, because even that is hard for us. We can't do it all the time. We put things above you, and we don't want to. So Lord, we thank you for the grace that you've shown us through the work of Christ. We thank you that Jesus willingly submitted, and he showed us how we ought to live in perfect faithfulness to you, and that he did it for us, so that even when we mess up, we're covered. Lord, as we go out this week, we pray that, that these things would impact our hearts, Lord, that our hearts would be opened up, that we would be filled with the Spirit, that you would allow us to have victory over sin so that we can worship you. Lord, we, we love you. We thank you. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Before the throne of God above. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, a word I look and see him there made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. To look on Him and pardon me. Spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and the grace. One with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased with.
with His blood, my life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. I bow before the cross of Christ and marvel at His love divine. God's perfect Son was sacrificed to make me righteous in God's eyes. This river's depths I cannot know, but I can glory in its flood. The Lord knows I have bowed down low and poured on me His glorious love. Poured on me his glorious love, and poured on me his glorious love. Father, we ask this morning that the dearest idols we have known, whatever those idols be, help us to tear them from your throne and worship only thee. Amen. So as we go this morning, let's bless each other with the benediction from Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now, and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you today.